Okay, welcome back to asymptotics and perturbation methods. Today's topic is something that comes from dynamical systems theory called delayed bifurcation. And uh, it'll use some of the techniques that we developed in boundary layer theory and also some of our um, knowledge of airy functions that we acquired in the course of thinking about the WKB method. So it's sort of a nice coda to those two parts of the course. And then after we do this example today, we'll be moving on to method of multiple scales starting in the next lecture. All right, so um, let me share with you here. All right, so this example, like some of the others we've done in the course is, is actually not from Bender and Orsog. This one comes from Mark Holmes' book um, on perturbation methods. There are two editions of that book, at least. I'm aware of, uh, I mean, I have the copy of, of an older one, but online we can see the 2013, the second edition. I think that may be the most recent. Anyway, um, those of you who have access to the Cornell library can get this book online for free um, through there. Anyway, so take a look at section 6.4 if you want to see Holmes' treatment of this problem. So let me describe it now. Um, so we're going to consider some kind of a bistable system, a physical or chemical system, could be biological even, or electrical. A bistable system with an operating characteristic that I'm going to sketch. Um, so it has a, a classic S shaped curve. So if I draw some variable Y versus a control parameter R. So think of this R as some kind of knob that you can turn on a physical system. Um, and let's suppose that this uh, system has these two stable states with a characteristic that looks like this. So this is a very common sort of scenario. I, the, the solid lines are supposed to indicate stable states. So that upper branch is stable. This lower branch is also stable. And the dashed line that connects them is unstable. States. And um, so now you imagine that you put the, the physical system in operating in the, um, the stable regime. Let's suppose for, to be specific, it's on the upper branch. Say it starts here. And um, then with your control parameter, you can move the, the R up and down and in steady state, the system will just be tracking this branch but the interesting thing is what happens when you get to this edge? Because then there's no more stable states. So as you may know, if you've ever studied hysteresis in dynamical systems, the system will then find its only available stable state at this point, meaning it'll jump down to here. And then as you continue increasing the parameter, it will keep going this way, let's say. And the interesting thing is if you then reverse the parameter and say, oh, I don't like that I just jumped off the cliff, let me go back. Of course, you won't jump up because now you're on this stable branch and you're gonna stay there all the way to here. And then only when you get to that point will you jump up after which, you know, going this way, you form that characteristic shape that's called a hysteresis loop. Okay, so that's what would happen at, um, you know, if you were sort of just tracking the equilibria. But the interesting thing is, what if you instead sweep the parameter at some non-zero rate, um, like you're actually just turning the knob at some speed, then what's observed in all kinds of systems from lasers to magnets and 
Actually, this is very useful, by the way. I mean, what I said so far is useful for switching devices, right? I mean, a switch is something that has like an on and an off or a memory state may have either something is stored or not stored. So this kind of bistable operating system is very useful in all kinds of electronics. And, um, you know, sometimes you wanna switch rapidly between the two states. And so the interesting thing is if you start going this way at some speed, instead of dropping straight down, what's observed in practice is that you go this way and you kind of have a, almost like a certain inertia and then you come down to here and then continue. And so this distance between here and where you actually landed when you sort of were, were going at a finite rate, this distance is what people think of as a, as a delay in where the bifurcation is occurring. The bifurcation referring to this jump down at that point at that saddle node bifurcation, if you know that jargon from dynamical systems. So anyway, if you switch at a finite rate, as I say, you get something that looks Or, oops, darn it. <laughs> sort of like this. And so here, the delay would refer to this distance. When I speak of the delay in the bifurcation, this is the delay. Um, okay, so this is, you know, if you sweep if you sweep R at some non-zero speed, see a delayed jump. And so the question that we wanna to answer today is how big is that delay as a function of the sweep rate? Um, how does a delay depend on the sweep rate and since it's a perturbation class, we're going to study this in the limit of very slow sweeping. So um, where we'll be able to get a nice asymptotic formula for the delay. So I'm going to show that the delay is proportional to epsilon to the two thirds power. Um, where epsilon is the rate of sweeping. And, you know, we're thinking here in the limit of small epsilon. Okay, so that's the interesting thing, this two thirds exponent. Where does that come from? So the, we're gonna investigate this in a simple model system. It doesn't really come from physics equations per se. It's just, I'm gonna just write down something algebraically that looks like the curve I drew here. This looks like a cubic curve. Um, and so if we just study as a little model system, something that looks like this, dy by d tau is a cubic, Let's say y minus y cubed over three uh, minus epsilon tau. Um, that's that epsilon tau term we can think of as being like the parameter r. Um, so r is going to equal our control parameter is epsilon tau, and that varies slowly. You know, in the sense that it will take time unit tau of order one over epsilon, in other words, a long time, 
to make an order one change in the quantity R. So that varies on that long time scale. All right, so that's our little model system. And um, we now wanna start analyzing that. So let's, um, just to save some writing, let's say F of Y refers to this cubic, Y minus Y cubed over three. Um, and let's just try to understand what happens, what do we expect for, I mean, of course that's nonlinear. So we're dealing here with a nonlinear differential equation. Um, what, does, uh, what do we expect if epsilon is zero, what can we say? You know, let's first understand that case. We can write down the little one dimensional phase portrait for the epsilon equals zero case. And the way we do that is we, um, whoops, draw, let's say a picture where we have dy by d tau on this axis. And let's draw y. So after all, the states live in, in the space where y is. So it, y characterizes the state of our system. Um, so we want to think about a point, an abstract point moving on the y-axis, but it obeys this equation dy d tau is, is f of y, which is this cubic now drawn this way. So, um, Here's my f of y. And you see, I've got um, two zeros of that. I mean, so let's just look up here. f of y is, this equals zero when y is plus or minus the square root of three, or also at y equals zero. Those are three fixed points here, here, and here. Um, and you can see from the way that dy by d tau is shown on the vertical axis that for a particle flowing on the y axis, it'll have a positive velocity underneath the part of the blue curve that's positive. It'll have a negative velocity here where the blue curve is negative, And then over here, it's negative again. And over here, it's positive. And so from that, you can see that trajectories will be attracted to these two points if you start somewhere on the y-axis. Um, there's an unstable point at the origin and stable points on either side, like that. So that's our, oh, but it's also worth noting this height because that's gonna come into the problem. That's a, you can check that that maximum is at a height of two thirds. And actually it's occurring, maybe I'll just erase this for a second. Um, it's occurring over a value of one. In case you wondered, why did I have that one third in there? You know, why does it say y cubed over three? It's for the convenience of having a one now, that f prime of y is one minus y squared. So the maximum and minimum occur at plus and minus one. Right, this is minus one over here where this min occurs. Okay, so that's what we know for epsilon equals zero. Now, what I'm trying to motivate in, in drawing this is how do we think about this if the parameter R is slowly varying? I mean, what I had written earlier was, you can think of this as, um, you know, this is of the form f of y minus r, that's a function of tau. So the, the r just plays the role of an intercept. Like as I increase r, what's gonna happen in the picture is that you would have at a later time, the picture will look just like a translated version of this just a little bit lower.
And so you can see what's happening there is that those intersection points here and here with the axis, they have now moved closer together than when they were here and here, right? As we, as we lower the curve, the black dot and the white dot look like they're moving towards each other. And then we get a critical case when they're just tangent. So that would be, let's say like this. That's when the saddle node bifurcation occurs and the stable and unstable point collide and, and coalesce. And then after you increase time even beyond that, then the stable point disappears altogether and you're just left with a function that's negative everywhere until you hit you know, somewhere over here. So in other words, the system will jump from this large value that started at some value a bit bigger than one, it's then moving towards one. And then at once it reaches one because of this, you know, once it falls off the cliff, basically, it's gonna jump all the way over to here. Okay, so that's just to, to motivate that fact that this picture that we're, this, this model system that I'm writing down has the properties I described earlier of something that stays on an upper branch and then it's gonna come, come jumping down to the lower branch. All right, so is there any question about anything so far? No, okay. So that was just, you know, to set it up qualitatively, but now let's start analyzing a bit. Actually, I mean, from this picture, you can sort of already get a feeling for when this jump might occur. If I look at where the red curve, you know, this, this dashed curve here, this one that's tangent, when is that happening? I mean, notice, remember I said this was at a height of two thirds. So it's gonna take, if I have to lower the whole thing by an amount two thirds to get to tangency, that sort of suggests when this moment of truth is going to occur, um, we would expect, you know, loosely speaking, I'd expect to jump when epsilon tau is around two thirds. So that'd give you an idea about what time is gonna be the critical time. All right, but let's look a little bit more carefully at all of this. And start doing some asymptotics. Okay. So first of all, we can see that we wanna think on this slow time scale. So let me let T, you may wonder why haven't I used T so far? Why was I using tau? It's because I wanna replace epsilon tau by T. So if I do that, then the ODE becomes this nice little system, epsilon, dy by this new variable t is y minus y cubed over three minus t. And so that's what I wanna focus on for the rest of our discussion. Excuse me, my phone is dinging. Don't like that. Okay. All right, so um, immediately you can see if we take the formal limit as epsilon goes to zero, then in fact, this differential equation degenerates into just an algebra equation, right? You lose the highest derivative, which in this case is the first derivative. So um, the outer solution in boundary layer speak is what we would get when we just set epsilon to zero. 
Um, and so in that case, if I think of writing y perturbatively as y0 plus epsilon y1 plus et cetera, this y0 will satisfy what we get by just plugging in epsilon equals zero. It obeys y0 minus y0 cubed over three equals t. Um, in more geometrical terms, what this outer solution is, is just, um, well, it just corresponds to being stuck, you know, in terms of this picture, you're just stuck on this, on this operating characteristic. This whole thing is, is sort of, you might think of as the outer solution, but actually we're only interested in this branch because remember we want stable behavior. So we're gonna focus on this branch until it comes to its turning point, till it's saddle node bifurcation. So this, this is what I'll refer to as the outer solution, this upper branch. And you can see that's what the, um, this algebra is giving us. So in terms of the picture, here's how it's gonna to go today. We're gonna to have, um, in the yt plane, here's t, here's y. Um, let me draw that cubic again. So I've got that. And then I'm gonna to refer to this stuff up here as the outer region. And then um, we are going to have in our, you know, finite rate solution, non-zero rate, when we come around like this, and then over to here, you can maybe sense that we're going around a corner. This part right here, that looks like when we did corner layers earlier in the course. So this, this system is gonna have a corner layer as its first interesting phenomenon. So there's a corner layer right there. And there's also going to be an interior layer. Corresponding to this downward jump. The corner layer is what's happening right in here as the system changes its direction from coming down at an angle to going straight down. So we actually have one kind of boundary layer followed by another in this problem. And that makes it a little juicier than anything we've done so far. All right, so as I say, we're gonna start on the upper branch And I just wanna note that up there, y zero is greater than one. That's gonna be important later because at one point we're gonna to have to count, choose between two different solutions. There'll be a certain square root and we'll have an issue of do we want the plus or the minus solution. One of them will give us a branch greater than one and one will, I mean, basically one of them is gonna correspond. If I approximate this part right here as a parabola, there's gonna be a positive branch, which will correspond to this upper piece of the parabola. And there will be a negative branch, which will correspond to this part. And we're not gonna need this part. We're gonna want the upper part. So anyway, I just wanna note y zero is greater than one, where one refers to this height, remember, right here at the corner, at the jump. And for the sake of connecting with earlier, this time corresponds to a time of two thirds in these scaled variables. Okay, so we have y zero greater than one. It satisfies this little algebraic condition that I wrote. And that's it, that's my outer solution, that algebraic equation. Okay, now we get to the heart of the matter, which is to think about the corner layer. So let us dive in there. This will take us most of our effort. 
<clears throat> okay, so I'm going to use um, tilde to, you know, that is the symbol that looks like this over my letters to denote corner variables. This is following the notation in Holmes' book. So um, that is, we wanna look near the corner, which we decided was at uh, a T of around two thirds and um, a Y value around one. So this motivates a choice of these new variables. I'm gonna define T tilde to be the relevant time scale in the corner. Define that to equal T minus two thirds divided by epsilon to some power, which I don't yet know, I'll call it alpha. So it's gonna be one of these dominant balance arguments where we're gonna to have to figure out the correct scaling in the corner layer. So for now we're being flexible and we're just saying epsilon to some power alpha. Um, meanwhile, the y variable, we'll write as y tilde, capital Y. We know it's near one, so I'll say one plus some other unknown scaling exponent gamma um, times a y1 plus in the spirit of regular perturbation theory, let's suppose it's just a simple power series. So I'll say epsilon to the two gamma y2, et cetera. So that's gonna be our onsots for the y and the t. And then let's plug that into the ordinary differential equation. Maybe we should circle these definitions. Um, I mean, actually, rather than say plus dot, 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 maybe I should be a little more specific. We really are thinking the next term will be order of epsilon to the three gamma or epsilon to the gamma cubed. Okay. So we're gonna make that substitution and plug that in to try to understand what's the right scaling in the corner. Okay, so plugging it in, let's see. So what was the ordinary differential equation? It was epsilon dy by dt is y minus y cubed over three. minus t. And so now in terms of the new variables, well, let's see what this becomes. Um, it's easiest to just sort of work with differentials, right? If I think of this as um, there's the epsilon, now what does the dy become? Well, if I take dy tilde, I'm gonna get epsilon to the gamma dy1. Um, let's just focus on the leading behavior for now. So I would get an epsilon to the gamma dy1 in the numerator of my, that's my dy. And then what about the dt? So if I stare at this expression, Think of multiplying across by the epsilon to the alpha. So dt would be epsilon to the alpha dt tilde. Oh, I should be putting a tilde over my y's, shouldn't I? There we go. Okay, so that was the changing the second, changing the derivative. And what about the other terms? Well, 
All right, this y, according to our ansatz, is one plus epsilon to the gamma y1 tilde plus epsilon to the two gamma y2 tilde plus dot, dot, dot. And then I have minus one third of that cubed to the gamma I mean this is a pretty unpleasant term right I'm going to have to cube this power series but so what we'll deal with it and then there's also minus t so the minus t is minus writing the definition for t that will be 2 thirds plus epsilon to the alpha t tilde. Okay, it looks kind of complicated. And you might be wondering, by the way, you know, like, on this side, I only kept y1 tilde, and I only kept the leading terms. Why am I keeping y2 here and here? Well, you'll see why in a minute, but the short answer is because the y1s are gonna cancel out to a certain extent. So you have to sort of carefully think about the various orders. I mean, it's, it's best to keep in a few extra orders just to check what's gonna cancel and what isn't. So just to be on the safe side, I'm keeping them for now and I can get rid of them later if I need to. All right, so let me simplify everything. Do you wanna ask anything about the substitution or anything so far? Oh, there's some comments in the chat. I missed those, sorry. Let's see what they are. Aha, so aha, Maria is asking that question. Good, you're always a few steps ahead of me. Why are, when we're writing that, yeah, why don't we include Y2, but we do include it in the left, I'm not sure I understand your abbreviation, but you're asking why do we only have Y1 on the left, but we have both Y1 and Y2 on the right? Um, was that the question? Yes. Yeah, so it's I wanna derive the leading order equation for Y1, but I want to make sure that I have all the correct terms. Um, what am I trying to say? I wanna make sure I'm not, Oh, let's see. Let me let me just do some algebra, and you'll see why I kept the y two briefly. Um, you don't really need it on the right hand side, but it took me a minute to realize I didn't need it. <laughs> that's a that's a long answer for why. So you probably could ignore it, but but just to be on the safe side, I included it. Watch how some cancellation occurs. So if I clean this up, okay. Thanks for the question, though. Wait, I'm sorry. I have one more question. Yes. Okay. Great. Um. So I'm, I'm confused about the relationship between our original variable y and y tilde. In the yeah. ansatz that you made, um, it seemed, do, we, do you want the left-hand side to be the original y is in terms of these y tildes? Yeah, that would probably be clearer. Um, when I speak about y in the corner, I call it capital Y tilde, but it's the same variable, it's the same thing. And so I agree with you, it's probably clearer to write it as, um, let's see if I can, I just wanna make a little room. Uh, there, that's what I meant to do. So let's put it this way. Yeah, it's a good comment. You should sort of think of it this way that y of t, I mean, in pure math, you would never write it this way, but in applied math, we understand what we mean when we say y of t is y tilde of t tilde. Hmm. Okay, I still didn't leave enough room, but I'm just trying to change variables into corner variables, but you're right. I'm referring to the same function y of t in these new variables. Okay, I, I see. Thank you. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. Other questions? We're good. Okay. So then let's um, simplify things a little bit. On the left, we get epsilon to the one plus gamma minus alpha, and that's then times dy1 tilde d tau tilde. Now, on the right, there's a lot of junk. And it, I could write it out. I mean, I'd have to cube that one term. It's not that hard. Maybe it's, maybe it's worth doing. I don't know. OK, I'm going to quickly write it out. I did do it in Mathematica also. But, but it's sort of interesting how it works. So if you look at the terms that are order 1, you have 1, then there's a minus one third, and there's also a minus two thirds, All right? Here's the one, here's the minus a third, and here's the minus two thirds. Okay, so those are the order one terms. Then the next lowest order, and notice they all cancel, then the, because of the way we've chosen things. Then the next order would be stuff of order epsilon to the gamma. And you could try to see what terms have order epsilon to the gamma. So, well, there's this one, epsilon to the gamma y1 tilde, but there's also going to be one that comes from this cube of this little binomial right here. If I take that binomial and cube it, think about the case where I get three times one squared times this. You know what I mean? So there will be that term, which would be, but it's getting subtracted. So it's a, a minus one third times three times a one squared times an E, uh, not E, epsilon, epsilon to the gamma y1 tilde. There's that term, which is of the same order. Um, Okay, and then also from the cube, there's a term which is one third, but now I square that epsilon to the gamma y1 term. So now it becomes epsilon to the two gamma y1 tilde squared times a one raised to the first power rather than squared. And then there will be another term, uh, See, this is what worried me when I, so the first time I did this calculation years ago, I only kept the Y1. And, and I thought everything was fine. But then I later realized, wait a second, I have, I've generated an epsilon to the two gamma with a Y1 in it, but I can also make an epsilon to the two gamma with a Y2 in it. And that scared me. Like, how, don't I have to keep that in there? So I did keep it in there the second time I did it just to see what's going on at that order. So let me keep writing stuff and watch what happens. Um, the last term shouldn't be multiplied by three. Oh yes, absolutely, thank you, good. That's right, thanks, great. That's right, there's a three there. Um, let me just put in the other potentially big terms coming from the cube. There's another term that looks like epsilon to the two gamma times y two tilde, right? Where is that coming from? That's this term up here, All right? That's also at order epsilon to the two gamma. And then um, there's also a term that I could get by taking again in, in the cube, if I have one squared times this term to the first power times three. So I have to worry about that one also. So that's good. That's a minus one third times three times one squared 
epsilon to the two gamma y2 tilde. And everything else is gonna be higher orders in the cube. I've kept everything worth keeping. So then there's plus stuff of order epsilon to the three gamma. And finally, I better not forget this term with the T. There's that also. So that's being subtracted. Um, T tilde. There. Okay. So now I think I've kept everything that I needed to keep. And the thing I didn't understand the first time I did this calculation, and the reason I kept the Y2 but didn't need to, is that this term cancels perfectly with this term. So even though they're of, the, of that order epsilon to the two gamma, I didn't need them. Um, what else is canceling? Notice that this term right here is canceling with this term. And of course, all of these guys are canceling. So you're left with, assuming we've done it right, and I think I did, you're left with um, minus epsilon to the two gamma times y1 tilde squared minus epsilon to the alpha T tilde plus the stuff that we're neglecting of order epsilon to the three gamma. So it's a really nice, beautiful simplification there. And, um, you know, I did it in Mathematica this morning and, and this seems to be right. Okay, so you're with me on the algebra, I hope. Okay, now let's stare at this because you see I've got three different powers of epsilon. Whoops. Um, there's this one, there's this one, and there's this one. And this is one of these nifty problems where there's a three term dominant balance rather than just two terms being dominant. The interesting phenomena occur if all three are of the same order of magnitude. That's what's happening in the corner. So if we look at the three term dominant balance to see what that would imply, You get a three-term dominant balance when, I'm just reading off the exponents, one plus gamma minus alpha equals two gamma equals alpha. And then that's a nice little system of two unknowns, <laughs> a linear system in two variables, like you would have done in your algebra one course in high school. And so you can solve that quickly to find alpha is two thirds and gamma is one third. Very nice. Yeah, isn't that pretty? So, so there, those are the, that's the scaling. And now that tells us the correct scaling in the corner layer. I mean, I think it's pretty cool. So, so there's that scaling and it's telling us that the, um, I mean, this instantly tells us that the corner layer has a width That's remember alpha is the exponent that tells me how um, time is scaling. It's epsilon to the alpha. So we're already seeing an epsilon to the two thirds. Let 
Like if we just wanted the scaling, we've already gotten that by this kind of dimensional analysis argument almost. Not exactly dimensional analysis, but, but a scaling argument. So that's coming out immediately. Um, but we can go farther. We can actually get a really nice prefactor in front of that scaling to figure out just how wide the delay is. And that's what the rest of the analysis will do for us. Not just the scaling, but the constant in front of the scaling. That's where the airy functions are gonna come in. So anyway, if I make this choice that I made here, then every, all the epsilon terms cancel out and um, we're left with, oh, actually I do wanna say one other thing. Notice that with this scaling, this term that we neglected, epsilon to the three gamma really is negligible because it's three times gamma is, is uh, three times a third, that's one. So this is epsilon to the first, whereas all of these are epsilon to the two thirds. And in this business, a higher power of epsilon means you're smaller, right? Because epsilon is a small quantity. So this term really is asymptotically negligible compared to everything else with this choice. All right, so anyway, um, Maybe that's just worth remarking. This tells us epsilon to the three gamma is order epsilon, which is much less than epsilon to the two thirds. Okay, anyway, um, so now cancel out all the epsilons and we're left with the ODE in the corner is dy1 tilde by dt tilde is, um, so just focus on what we got. We have y1 squared minus t tilde. And that's a beautiful little equation in its own right. And um, it's not obvious how to solve that. I mean, if you, that is not one you would have seen before in a basic differential equations course, but if you had a good solid like second course in differential equations, you might've run into it there. Oh, I think I left out a negative sign. I'm ahead of you, Maria, you didn't write it in the chat yet. There's a negative in front of the Y1 and there's a tilde over the Y1. There. <laughs> Gotta get up pretty early to catch Maria. Okay, smiley face. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Um, yeah, so that's what we're left with there. And this is a famous equation. This is called a Riccati equation. And people know some things about Riccati equations. You can learn about it in Bender and Orsog if you want. Look at page 21 in Bender and Orsog. But I'm not gonna go into the theory of the Riccati equation, except to say, here's how we're gonna approach it. There's a neat trick for analyzing it, which is, I don't know who thought of this, but it's great. Um, let's introduce a little, not obvious move, little change of variables. Let me let y1 tilde equal some new variable w prime divided by w. Why on earth would anyone do that? I don't know, but it's very clever. Watch what happens if you do it. Um, uh, I guess the thing to observe is the Riccati equation is nonlinear, right? It's got a y1 squared. If you make this crazy change of variables, you can linearize the equation. Here, the prime means um, with respect to t tilde. So I'm abusing the notation a little. 
So this is D by D T tilde. Okay, but anyway, what happens if I substitute that in? Then I get dy1 tilde dt tilde equals. On the one hand, let's just differentiate this expression in the box, this thing, using the quotient rule. So using the quotient rule, you get um, w w double prime minus w prime squared all over the denominator squared and um Honestly, I think that this is the intuition for where this genius cap, genius trick comes from. When you do the quotient rule, you get a term that looks like W prime squared over W squared. And that looks like the quantity Y1 squared. So I think that was the insight that someone realized it sort of looks like one piece of the quotient rule if I do this. I don't know, but anyway, if I now take the ODE and just manually substitute in, I also get W prime over W all squared minus T tilde. And so now if you compare these two expressions, um, Except I made a mistake. It's that negative sign I keep forgetting. This negative sign right here has to go in front of this term. There. So now with that wonderful move, um, we get a lot of cancellation, right? This term matches this term. Well, I guess I better include the negative sign. So those cancel and I'm left with uh, let's see w w double prime over w squared equals minus T tilde. And then canceling out a W, you get the W double prime um, equals minus T tilde W. So what did we just do? I, I, instead of having to deal with the Riccati equation above, I now have an equation for this variable W. And the, once I know W, then I know Y1. So what does W satisfy? Well, W satisfies that equation, but we've seen that equation. That's the area equation. So that's the Aries equation, except it's a little different than what we're used to writing. We usually have it with a positive T. So this is Aries equation with a minus T. Um, not T. Well, I'm using with tildes. So but that's okay, we can tolerate that. And so what it's telling us is that the solution is a linear combination, W of T tilde is of the form A0, airy function AI of this argument minus T tilde plus some other 
constant, let's call it A1, the other airy function bi, again, of minus t tilde. And so then now that we know what W is, now we know what Y is because Y1 tilde was defined as W prime over W. So we're getting this big expression. Let's put the world's biggest division symbol. Um, so I get minus the quantity A0 AI prime of minus T tilde plus A1 BI prime minus T tilde all over itself without the primes. Okay. Wow, that would not have been easy to guess without that trick. <laughs> but that's the corner solution at lowest order. Fantastic. Okay, that's some amazing looking object. Now, um, you wanna ask anything at this point? Right, so it's very algebraic um, looking. And what we have to do next is figure out how to match this to the outer solution. Remember, we calculated the outer solution. That's just that algebraic expression. Since this is a corner solution, it has to match onto that outer solution at one side. And then on the other side, it's gonna jump straight down. So um, we need to determine A0 and A1. To match this to the outer solution. And here, here's what it comes down to. There are two cases, um, depending on if A0 is, well, actually, be, before I say that, maybe I should say, where is the matching supposed to take place? Um, remember, we're in this corner layer. We're thinking about times that are close to, what was it? If we go back, times are close to two thirds in the original units. But because we're, a pro, we're interested in a match coming from the outer solution and we were on the upper branch, if I go back even further, remember this picture, two thirds is this time when this place occurs. On the, upper, on the outer solution, time is everywhere less than two thirds, right? So we want to approach two thirds from the negative side as far as the outer layer is concerned. And in this layer, like if we could look in a microscope, this little layer is supposed to be taking an infinite amount of time with respect to the new scaled variable, the T tilde. So that would be out at negative infinity as far as the T tilde is concerned. So that's what I wanted to get across that intuition. That, um, so we wanna do the matching We want to match as t goes to two thirds, excuse me, from below, t tilde should be going to negative infinity as far as the inner layer is concerned. And also we want, so this is where I want to remind you that y zero in the outer solution, we're on the upper branch, this is greater than one. So um, the Y is going to be coming down towards one from above. All right, so um, I'm gonna show, let me just not keep you in suspense. We'll show that um, A1 
equals zero is required for matching to the outer solution. That is, there are no BI terms. Remember A1 is the coefficient of the BI. We sort of don't tend to like this BI solution because it blows up, right? So we don't, we're not gonna have any and you're gonna see there's a principled reason why we don't have any. So it's at this point that I diverge from the treatment in Mark Holmes' book. Um, if you look at Holmes' approach, it's perfectly good. I mean, it's totally fine. He, um, Holmes uses a technique called intermediate variables to do the matching. He uses a so-called intermediate variable, which is suitable for the overlap region between the, the corner and the outer. Um, so he defines a variable that he calls T sub eta, which he defines as T minus two thirds over epsilon to some other power eta, where the eta is between um, zero and two thirds. It could be any number between zero and two thirds. And he um, you know, so it, like in those terms, if you write it this way, T is two thirds plus epsilon to the eta T sub eta. Maybe I'll put a little demarcation line here. So he then thinks of hold. T eta fixed, and then let epsilon go to zero from the positive side. And then you'll see that T will go to um, two thirds and the T tilde will be going to minus infinity. If I, oh, actually, I guess I need to fix, um, yeah, actually you want T eta to be negative. Let me put it this way. Choose a negative T eta. Then this is a smooth way of taking this intermediate limit. You fix a T eta, you let epsilon go to zero, you simultaneously achieve that T goes to two thirds from the negative side and T tilde will go to minus infinity. Um, you write everything in terms of T eta and just do a match. So you can look at his book to see it done that way. I, I previously used to do it that way in my notes and I think it's overkill. I think there's a much easier way to do this. So I wanna show you the much easier way. It's equivalent, but I think it's just much more obvious if you do it this way. Instead, I'm gonna just I'll do the match by um, just looking at the at the T tilde goes to minus infinity asymptotics directly. So that's the end of that little interlude with Holmes. So watch what I mean. This, this, I, I think you'll agree if you watch his way of doing it in the book versus what I'm about to show you that this way is very straightforward. So let me stop sharing my notes there and just jump out to Mathematica for a minute. Um, so I did this this morning. Okay. Um, the first thing I'm showing you here in the notebook, is this readable or would you like it bigger? I never know. A little bit bigger? No, it's all good. <laughs> I don't know, I'm an old man. You like it the way it is, all right. 
That's even more readable, isn't it? Maybe it's excessive. Anyway, this first calculation was just the one that we did where I showed that I don't actually need these Y2 terms. So everything cancels out and we just get what we had earlier. Okay, fine. But now here's the interesting point. Let's think about these functions A, I, and B. Actually, it is too big. <laughs> I'm gonna, sorry, ridiculous. I'm gonna go back to 200%. Okay, so here's what A, I, and B, I look like if you need reminding. The airy function B, I is this one here in orange and it's oscillating and then it blows up as X goes out to infinity, grows exponentially. The, the airy function AI oscillates over here and then damps out exponentially. It's interesting too, the way they're interlaced, you know, in terms of their phase. One behaves sort of like cosine plus a phase shift and one behaves like sine plus a phase shift. We've seen that with the WKB method, I think. But anyway, what, what remember, we we're interested in the asymptotics of AI and BI as this variable T tilde goes to negative infinity. That's what we need to do the match. So what is their asymptotics? Well, you can just ask Mathematica. I mean, we, or we could do it with the techniques we developed earlier in the course. You would find this interesting asymptotic formula for airy BI and airy BI prime, which comes into it. Um, and also, if I look at the ratio of those two, I mean, maybe I should make this point. In the formulas we had earlier, remember I had a linear combination of both a, uh, airy AI and airy BI. If you have any amount of BI, this orange one, it will completely crush the AI because both it and its derivative are much bigger than this thing, which is going to zero and its derivative is going to zero. So if you have any amount of BI, it will dominate the large X behavior. And now think of BI, think of X as being like this confusing variable negative T tilde. So we're interested in what's happening out here at large X. This is like negative T tilde. So if I look at area of negative T as T tilde is going to negative infinity, that is area BI of a positive argument. If I look at that ratio of these prime, Airy BI prime over BI, which appeared in my expression for W Y1, Y1 tilde. This is the point. I get negative square root of negative T. This negative sign is crucial. I get negative square root in BI prime over BI. You can see it visually if I just show you. Airy of BI prime over Airy BI with a negative sign in front of it, compare it to negative square root. They basically behave the same for large X. So this thing shows negative square root behavior. If I only, if I got rid of the BI terms by setting that coefficient to zero, then I only have to look at the airy AI prime over itself with a negative sign. And that gives positive square root behavior. You, you have to work through the details of all these formulas up here to really see that, but just trust me or trust Mathematica that in one case, you're getting positive square root behavior as I'm showing here. That's if I eliminate the BI. If I have any BI, I get negative square root. Okay, and now the important point. To match in the corner, what is the asymptotics of the outer solution as you approach the corner? Well, I just plug in. The, this is what the corner solution satisfies, this little algebraic equation here. I can guess a solution of the form one plus a scaling epsilon to the one third times some unknown constant A. And also I know my T, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my mouse. Um, here's the scaling on T, plug all that in, solve for this coefficient A, and you end up getting two solutions. That's when I spoke earlier that I would get two solutions when I round that corner because one of them is the upper branch and one of them is the middle branch. I know I want the upper branch because I started on the upper branch. And that's the point that I, I know I want the upper branch. That tells me I want the plus sign. So I have to get a scaling one plus something that behaves like a square root. And finally, that's my answer. Since I know I want a positive square root, that tells me I want all AI and no BI. 
Okay, so that's my way of doing the matching. But as I say, you can look at Holmes way with the um, intermediate variable and you'll get the same thing. Okay, so let me go back to my notes now. That, that was sort of the hardest part of this. Uh, all right, so the upshot is that I want um, my solution yi, y1 tilde is gonna come out to be um, just AI prime of negative T tilde over AI. Oh, is there a negative sign in there? I think there is. Yeah, T tilde. And so then the solution itself, Y tilde, remember this is only the leading correction. It's gonna be one, minus epsilon to the third, AI prime minus T tilde over AI minus T tilde. And so this is my corner layer expansion. You see, I'm running out of time, but I'm just gonna keep going for another couple minutes because we're almost done. So this is a really interesting expression. If you'll allow me, let me just jump back one more time to Mathematica. If I stop sharing that, start sharing this. Okay, so here I am in Mathematica. So let's see what that expression for y1 tilde looks like. If I look at negative airy ai prime over airy ai of minus t tilde, it looks like something dropping off a cliff, which is what it should look like, right? So this is the part that matches onto the outer solution. And this part is actually going straight down. Now, I've chopped it off at a particular number, 2.338. Why did I do that? Well. Let me show you what happens if I went farther. Some real time mathematics. I don't usually do this. Let's suppose I go out to 10. See that interesting behavior? That's what this interesting object does. It actually has a, a blow up. It blows up to minus infinity at this number where I'm dividing by zero. So you could ask, what is the first place where you're dividing by zero in the airy function AI? And it turns out that root is a well-known root. It's that number 2.338. Or put it another way, if I look at the airy function itself, that's this blue curve. You're looking at the first zero of the airy function right there, that's negative 2.338. That's a crucial number and that's what determines how far you get in the corner layer, but then you suddenly, according to this prediction, you'd be going down to negative infinity. Now that's not right. You don't go all the way down to negative infinity. You go straight down, but then something else happens as you leave the corner layer. You have to match on to another layer to accommodate hitting the lower branch. Okay, so that's why you need a second layer in the problem. And that's the interior layer. So I don't really wanna keep you too long. I mean, if you have to leave, maybe you should go at this point. But for those of you who can stay, um, I'm just gonna complete the analysis by showing that interior layer calculation, which goes pretty quick. Um, but so I, I do understand if you have to go. All right, so let me continue though um, with what I just said. So I've got this picture. Oh. Let me go back to sharing my other screen. Uh, let's share this one. Mm -hmm. Wait, I'm confused again. What am I doing?
Ugh, this happens to me. Sometimes I get confused when I'm stressed out. Okay, there I go. <laughs> Come on. Mirror the screen. Do it. Oh, please come on. Come on, mirror. What am I doing wrong? This is my punishment for going over time. Why is it not playing? Wait, are you, you're not, are you seeing the screen? You're good, okay, cool. All right, so then um, what I wanted to show is the sketch of what I just drew that minus AI prime of minus T tilde over AI minus T tilde, this one's a prime up there. So we've got this thing that I just showed you that looks about like this. Um, where there's this asymptote at T zero tilde equals two point um, three, three, eight. This is my T tilde axis. And then there's that, all that other stuff happening over here that we don't really care about. Or that. So, um, so this T zero tilde, this corresponds to um, a T zero equals two thirds plus this interesting prefactor. This is the thing I said we would be able to calculate with our method, 2.338 dot, 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 epsilon to the two thirds. And this is actually giving us the delay. This is our formula for the delay. This part. Um, okay, so we've got that. As I say, this looks like This looks like falling off a cliff. As expected. But as I say, it goes a little bit too far. It goes all the way down to negative infinity. And so you need to somehow patch that up. And so that's this final step with the interior layer. All right, so let's complete this by going into the interior. All right, so this is where we jump to the lower branch. All right, well, um, so now we're gonna look in the neighborhood of T0. that asymptotic value where we jump straight down. So now we're gonna use stars to denote the inner layer. So I'm gonna write T star is T minus T zero over some scaling epsilon to the kappa, where kappa is some other exponent appropriate for the inner layer. And now we have our t greater than t zero because we've already made the jump. Um, where you remember that my t zero means um, two thirds plus epsilon to the two thirds t zero tilde.
So what to assume for the y? So we're gonna write y, I mean, again, it's sort of like y of t is, think of it as y star of this new variable. Uh, t star, which we're gonna write as asymptotic to um, just y zero. Let's, we only need the lowest order term. That's gonna be enough. And we don't actually need a scaling on y because it's an order one jump. So we don't have to put any epsilons in front of it. We could see from the picture that the jump is order one. So if you plug all that in, that is this choice for T star with the kappa in it, and then this choice for Y, then the ODE, well, it was epsilon dy dt is Y minus Y cubed over three minus T, so what does that become now with this scaling? We get epsilon dy zero star over epsilon to the kappa dt star is, um, well, you can clean that up to write it as epsilon to the one minus kappa dy zero star dt star. But then from the ODE, this should equal y0 star minus a third y0 star cubed minus, and then we have to substitute for t. So I had that expression up here for t you know, when we're looking near um, T zero. Uh, why have I said what T is? Oh, I see. What I can do is take this right here and solve for T, right? So replace this T with that T and use this definition of T zero. So putting all that in, you get minus two thirds, plus epsilon to the two thirds T zero tilde plus epsilon to the K or kappa T star. Okay, so now if you stare at these equations, here I've got an epsilon to the one minus kappa. If I look at this stuff, this is the only balance. I mean, here I wanna balance these order one terms. So I actually need a kappa of one. These are the dominant terms on the right-hand side. So the balance is a kappa of one. Which is not a big surprise. That's our usual scaling in a layer. Right, that's just um, a time scale of order epsilon. So it takes order epsilon time to do this fast jump straight down. That's, that's not a slow process. The slow thing is going around the corner, jumping straight down is much faster. But anyway, so imposing that kappa equals one, then we get the differential equation dy zero star dt star equals y zero star minus a third y zero star cubed uh, minus two thirds to leading order. And this is a very nice little differential equation that you can understand qualitatively by just looking at this picture. Whoops, this is what it looks like. Uh, 
I have a cubic that comes up tangent like so. And it's not surprising because we're right at the jumping off point. So in terms of the y0 star axis, and this is dy0 star dt star, we have a half stable fixed point here. Right, it's stable from this side, but unstable from this side. And then we jump down to the lower branch here, which is at negative two. Now you have to keep in mind that the initial condition is, I mean, after we've gone around the corner, our Y is now less than one. This place right here is one. So having gone around the corner, our initial condition is like say here. Uh, right, we're a little bit less than one. So what's gonna happen is we just go screaming straight across to there. And that all happens, I mean, the way things are scaled, that would happen in some order one amount of time relative to this time scale T star. But that means order epsilon time in terms of the original problem. So um, anyway, you get the idea. So, so that part is not very interesting, but um, that completes the problem. I mean, that's the whole analysis. You, you go down the outer solution, take your time around the corner, zap down to the bottom. And so now we have that beautiful formula for the delay that we got from the corner analysis. All right, sorry, that took me 15 minutes more than we normally would take, but I hope you enjoyed it. It's a, a good workout for all the techniques we developed so far in the course. All right, thanks for your attention. I have a and, um, oh, sure, you could ask a question now. So uh, if you go to uh, the higher equation, you have an epsilon to the two thirds. Why do you choose epsilon? Uh, why do you choose K to be one and not two thirds, for example? So it just seems to me that, in, in this balance yeah, up here? Exactly. It just seems right. like K equals to one is kind of arbitrary. Well, so I do have um, an epsilon here. I mean, I could choose a, a balance that was the balance for the corner layer, but I already did that problem. You know, having done the corner layer, I'm looking for a different, uh, or maybe the point would be, I mean, okay, you're suggesting why don't I pick kappa equals one third so that these two would be the big terms? For example, yeah. But then would they be? I don't think they would be, you see, because these terms here are order one and they would be much bigger than these epsilon to the two thirds terms. Okay, but still so, yeah. epsilon to the two to the two thirds because epsilon is very small, it's still bigger than epsilon to the K if we choose K to be one, right? It's dominating this term. Yeah, so in- The in problem that is that this term is big. This oh, is the big, this is the big term right I here. I see, okay. This is the big term, which is matching against this. I understand now, okay. Yeah, those are the biggest okay. terms. No, yeah, don't pay that, attention that to this, this term is irrelevant. Okay. Yeah, that term is irrelevant. The, the dominant balance comes from, I mean, I should maybe say it like this. This is the balance and that occurs when this is matching that. Okay. Yeah, those are the big terms. And I have or, one more question. Also this, I mean, this is order so, one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so when we have corner layers, uh, from how we discussed before, you usually have something like, um, like a vanishing things or, or something that changes sign? What, uh -huh. what changes sign here? Well, the way I think of a corner layer is that, that I come in in one direction and then I swerve off into a different direction. Like oh, we saw okay. examples that looked like absolute value functions. Yeah. Here, I think of it as sort of in the same spirit, except that I was coming in, you know, at sort of this direction and then I'm going out at this direction. Okay. So it's just like the changing of direction. So you've swerved like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. It's continuous, but it's got a change in the derivative that in terms of the original problem is very rapid. Okay. 
Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, so this is, like I say, a pretty cool analysis. Um, anyway, thanks for sticking around so long and really following all the details. All right, so see you next time.